Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Ramp. Real access motivates progress. We took a couple of weeks off so I could uh, recoup a little bit, um, but we are back and we are in full swing and we have a great guest for you tonight. We have Paul Jones from the Care Concierge of New England. Welcome, Paul, and thank you for doing the show tonight. Hi, Tina. Thanks for having me. Um, why don't we get right into it? And why don't you tell a little bit about who you are and what you do and what your organization is all about? Sure. So I'm the owner of the Care Concierge of New England, which is a senior referral and placement service. And that means that I help seniors and their families navigate all of the options that are out there for senior care. Typically, I work with families who are interested in assisted living and memory care, but I also work with families who need skilled nursing, home care, introductions to real estate agents, elder law attorneys, financial planners, pretty much whatever you can think of in terms of the aging process, I can help people find. And these are partners of mine as well. These are people who have taken the people or organizations that I've taken the time to get to know, uh, get to know well, and make sure that they adhere to the two pillars on which I've built my company, which is quality of life and the ability to age in place for the seniors whom, I, whom I'm helping. Uh, I worked in the uh, the corporate world for a while. I worked in assisted living as a, as a director. Uh, I was a activities director at one point, moved on to Alzheimer's care, and I was an executive director. But I got tired of the of the corporate atmosphere of feeling like I had to try to convince people to go for my specific building, regardless of whether or not, you know, uh, maybe we were the best fit or the right location. We had to try and fill that building. And I wanted to take a much different tactic. I wanted to give people the opportunity to find their quality of life, regardless of what they were making, regardless of what they had in the bank, regardless of where they were in their aging journey. And starting the Care Concierge gave me the chance to give that quality of life to people. I've been open now two years, which is uh, crazy to think about. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Um, Ramp has been around for two years, too. So it looks like we had the same kind of mindset and set ourselves on the same kind of journey around the same time. Um, that must have been a huge um, turnaround with COVID last year. Um, how did COVID affect what you do? Did it make it better or worse or kind of stayed the same? COVID, COVID came in waves in terms of how it impacted people looking for senior care options. So I remember in March, uh, right when things started locking down, immediately families who I'd been working with said, nope, we're going to ride this out. We're going to see where this goes. Paul, we'll give you a call in a couple of weeks when the lockdown's over. And then we saw the lockdown was continuing. And the news was getting worse every day. And families started to really panic because they wanted their loved ones to be safe more than anything else. But they didn't know if their loved one was going to be safe in any sort of senior care environment. And that caused a lot of isolation for families, but also a lot of isolation for older adults who thrived based on the type of interaction they were able to have with the outside world. Senior centers, friends, families, uh, going down to the park, having a cup of coffee with some friends. All of those options started going away. And so uh, with that came an increasing need for senior care because people were not doing as well at home not just emotionally, but also physically. We saw an increase in falls. We saw an increase in folks not taking care of themselves. Uh, depression certainly uh, was, was a tr contributing factor for that. And then in the summer, the numbers started going down in Rhode Island. And so I started getting calls again from families saying, okay, we're ready. COVID's over. Let's go ahead and start this process and, and get people moved in. And so for this time last year, actually, so May, June, July into August, 
people started making moves again. People started exploring senior care, started feeling a little bit better. And then the autumn happened and we saw that huge spike again. And with that, families started saying, I give up. We don't know what's going to happen with COVID. We don't know what's going to happen with our loved ones. We're just going to try and maintain and just figure this out. But then you had families who got into real crisis, not just because they were helping support their older loved ones, but these were typically the same families that also had young children that were home from daycare, preschool, or school. And so you had these older adult children who are also parents uh, trying to manage juggling life that's just so full and their own job working from home or maybe they're, they've they been laid off or whatever it is, the uncertainty. This is a very long way of saying that COVID caused a lot of strain on families and family units. And now with the, the advent of the vaccines, I am seeing a lot more comfort in families who are saying, okay, let's start exploring this. Let's start figuring this out for real because uh, we need to make sure there's a plan in place. But there's also been a huge uptick in crisis-based calls. Families who have said, you know, probably should have explored senior care a year and a half ago. Wasn't expecting COVID to come along. I thought we had all the time in the world. But, you know, my mother, my father, my brother, my, my wife, my friend, they have dementia. The dementia has gotten worse in their isolation. And now we need to make a move yesterday. I can help families in either scenario. That's not a problem. Um, but I've just seen there be such an emotional toll on families of all ages that we're going to be seeing the impact of for years and years to come. Did you have a hard time of letting families see the places that they wanted to put their loved ones? Um, like, was there like a policy where with all of the restrictions that they couldn't, you know, go in and tour. So how did you really pick a place or knowing if it was the right place or meeting the staff? Because with all of the restrictions in place, I'm sure that made that a lot difficult. Luckily enough, a big part of the concierge concept is that I took a lot of time early after I started the business to go to many different senior care facilities, be there assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, to vet their teams, to meet their directors, to taste their food, maybe a little too much, obviously, <laughs> but to really see what, was, <laughs> to see what was going on in the buildings, because it's not enough for me just to look online and go, oh yeah, that building's pretty, that looks good. The chandeliers don't take care of you. You know, you want to make sure that if you are going into a place where your loved one is going to be part of that family, they're being taken care of by people who really understand what senior care is all about, which is a focus on the care. And COVID right. made that very difficult. Um, luckily enough, I saw that senior care communities adapted in a lot of ways very, very well to a lot of the challenges that COVID threw at them. And one of the biggest challenges was people still do need to move in, especially in a crisis situation, but how are they going to see the community? Right. And so a year, a year and a half ago, I would ask my community partners, okay, do you have a virtual tour I can share with people? Do you have pictures of your community? And the answer would almost always be, a virtual tour. Oh, that's stupid. We're not going to do that. Just bring them in, have them walk around. They, they're really going to get the feel of the place. And so uh, maybe within the first three or four months after the shutdowns really began in earnest. So, uh, you know, so call it from March, April to like August, most assisted living communities developed these really good, robust virtual tours. It's no substitute for the ability to right. walk into a building and see everything, smell the building, you know, see, see how the staff are interacting with residents, taste the food, all of that. You know, there's a real five senses approach that I have to take to, to buildings when I'm making right. recommendations and that was tough. It's, it's getting easier, but it's really only getting easier now. Right. Assisted living communities 
only in the last couple of weeks started allowing professionals like myself to be able to go in and uh, visit again. So, yeah. you know, I you love know. I love the fact that you say that you vet the places because, you know, that's a big thing that Ramp prides itself on is we're not going to recommend somebody that doesn't call us back or doesn't get back to us or doesn't do the things that we want them to do, that it's really, you know, a blessing to hear you say that you're only going to, you know, promote places that you trust, that you've seen, that you've talked to, that you've tasted, you know, and I think that makes the family feel a little bit better because, you know what I mean, they have a better sense, especially now when they can't do it themselves to at least have somebody in their corner that's doing that. Do you see that the families are thankful for that? They are. And it also helps because there are portions of assisted living design, senior care design, that families uh, don't take into consideration when they're trying to choose where it is their loved one is going to go. So here's a perfect example that I try to look for as part of my discovery process. So when I sit down with a family, if you were to recommend a family to me, and I would go sit down with them either in person, on a Zoom call, or over the phone, and I talk with them for anywhere between half an hour to an hour and a half. Because I want to really understand what it is this family is looking for. Because this is not an easy decision. It's not a quick decision, typically. You want to know, okay, What's the financial reality this person is dealing with? Who are the influencers in their lives? What's the location they want? Especially in Rhode Island. I've had people right. say, I will not go to South Kingstown. I live in North Kingstown and that's where I live. Okay, I get it. You know, it, it is what it is. Right. But what are the well, they want the convenience to go. Yeah, they want the convenience of being able to visit, but yet not being too far out of their comfort zone either. Right, right. Not that you uh, can't exactly. do one end of Rhode Island to the other in 45 minutes and with sightseeing, but, you know, the typical Rhode Island mentality is if it's more than 10, 15 minutes, it's on the other side of the world. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I grew up outside Boston. So for me, uh, like an hour trip was, was pretty standard. Um, but when, when I moved here to Rhode Island, I live in North Smithfield with my wife and my daughter now. I was very surprised. And even now, I think if I'm going to Smithfield, I take a deep breath and I'm like, all right, 10 minutes. Yeah. I can I can drive for 10 minutes. It's going to be all right. But anyway, going back to what that, I was saying. About I mean, my, family, my family's all in Canada. So we literally would get out of oh, wow. school, go to Canada, go to St. Hubert's Barbecue, visit and go to school the next day. My father would drive all night. We'd sleep in the van and we'd go to school the next day. So nothing is far to me. I just moved out to right. Barville and everybody's like, you moved way out there? Like I moved to like, you know, a whole nother state. I'm like, I'm only in Barville. <laughs> right. Right. It's funny how it it's funny how it changes in relation to the state, you know, because I have friends in Texas who are, you know, they think that a three hour trip is just a, a like a jaunt to the store. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but one thing that families don't think about and that you really can't get from the website or the virtual tours, even sometimes just conversations with sales directors or people that work in the communities. What are the special design features of the community? And by community, I mean an assisted living facility, but they're called communities because they empower residents through a, a social model community setting. That's why I call them communities. With the community, the design choices can help promote dignity, which in turn enriches quality of life. So here's a perfect example. For my clients who are in a wheelchair, I want to try to find an assisted living community that had the presence of mind during the design features to have raised outlets so that my client who may be in a wheelchair doesn't feel disempowered in their own living space to have to say, I'm in my wheelchair. I can't reach down to where the, the outlet is. I need to call somebody to come and help me plug in a lamp. No, they have the power to do that and have that dignity, have that quality of life and have that sense of independence. And, you know, I think sometimes that 
um, some senior care communities in the rush to be the biggest, the shiniest, the prettiest. They lose out a little bit on those common sense design features that allow people uh, to live every day with the with their dignity and their quality of life. And that in turn increases their ability to age in place, which is, you know, which is what you want. You want your residents to be happy, healthy, and long lived. As a wheelchair user, I appreciate that because it's true. I don't believe anybody is inaccessible or does something maliciously. I do believe they do it because it's an oversight. It's something they don't think about because they don't have a loved one in that particular circumstance. One of the biggest things that I find is, you know, even though Rhode Island is 20% people with disabilities, um, which is like almost one in four people has a disability, 7% of that uses a mobility device. The what people don't think about though is when you turn 65 and you now happen to use a mobility device, you're not disabled. So 30%, 5% of Rhode Island is elderly and 21% of that uses a, a, a mobility device. So look at, I mean, you're talking almost 30% of Rhode Island uses a mobility device and how inaccessible our state really is. You know, another thing that do you look at is the grounds outside for wheelchair users, because I know I've gone to a few high rise buildings and stuff, and they literally have to go a mile down the street to a 7-Eleven to get into a restaurant or a haircut or, or something like that, because there's nothing that's accessible around the building, which I think is such a shame. Right. I think that more and more buildings, luckily, are adapting as time goes on. And uh, a lot of buildings are a little set back away from um, other community features, like downtown areas. Some communities are right in downtown areas, but a lot more assisted living communities are, are in more rural areas, which has its pros and cons. But I am seeing a lot more attention that's starting to be paid in general to mobility device friendliness and accessibility which is good because when I first got into this industry, even 10 years ago, there were, there were things that had been um, lost in translation. And that came from two different, two different sides. That came from the side of assisted living operators who were just taking buildings, maybe a, a doctor's office, uh, whatever it might be, and transforming it into an assisted living community expecting that the assisted living resident at the time would be a little more mobile. And then on the other end of that, well, no, I'll, to your point, which is a great point, a lot of folks who are over the age of 65 are now using mobility devices. And that gets lost a lot in the, in the conversation that people have about aging. You know, people right. talk, and by people, I just mean, you know, you hear a lot about it in uh, media right. or conversation about families and friends, people say, ah, oh, you get old, you start losing your marbles. Typically not. But what happens uh, more often is that people start experiencing a some type of decline in the ability to uh, either be vision decline uh, or hearing decline or the need for a mobility device. And these are folks who are now over the age of 65 who are trying to deal with maybe several of these things happening at once on top of them aging, on top of them maybe looking at retirement, on top of them maybe looking at a move. So it's really no wonder that uh, the majority of folks moving into assisted living communities are doing it because uh, they have to, because they're a fall risk or they're feeling isolated in their own home because they're trying to manage the ability to uh, navigate these new normal right. times for them. And, and yeah, communities it, are catching really, up. Yeah, it's really difficult. The, the sad part that I see though is when your loved one is aging and they start to need a mobility, they, some people just buy them offline or, you know, my aunt's not using hers anymore, but those aren't as transferable as people think they are. They could actually, putting them in the wrong device, could actually do more harm than good. Um, at mm -hmm. what point in the process do you suggest families 
contact you to start this process? And how long does the process take? I, I think that families should contact me if they think that their loved one may need senior care within the next year. And again, this could be senior care of any type. You know, you could want to explore uh, home care or you could want to explore, you know, hey, I'm just trying to figure out what's the process by which somebody might have to move into assisted living someday. Uh, right. That's not most of the calls I get. <laughs> most of the calls I get I can are imagine. Uh, people. <laughs> yeah. Are, um, you know, as I've been looking at my, my hair and the camera, I can't help it because I'm like, when did I do that? And then I realized I've been kind of pulling my hair a little bit today because, you know, families, they don't know. They can't help it. And you can't circle a day on the calendar and go, right. okay, that's the day that mom's going to fall and break her hip. So I better be ready to make sure that I got a plan in place. You don't know. Um, but right. that's the majority of the calls I get are people in crisis who say, Paul, you know, we waited a little bit too long. It's it's time to make a move. The social worker at the hospitals overwhelmed themselves. They gave us a, a list of communities on a piece of paper. We called three of them. The numbers aren't working or the, it's, it's a new community name or whatever have you. Help. And so right. because of crisis situations, you know, I can I, I've learned how to make a move happen very, very quickly. Pre-COVID, the fastest turnaround time from the initial phone call to somebody moving into their new home was six hours for me. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes into it. A lot of things happened right that day that I needed to happen, but we got it done. You know, now with now post, not post COVID, but now as vaccinations are rolling out and there's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a process in place for communities who are, are, are accepting people in this uh, COVID world, you know, I could get a move in done within probably three days, you know, so, which is still very quick, but for a family who has uh, zero time and whose loved one is now privately paying in a rehab situation at $500 a day, right. that's a very expensive wait. Yeah. Um, give us a quick overview of the basic process. I know it's a lot of detailed process, but basically what, when a, family contacts you, what can they expect? Like, give us a little overview of the process. Of, of my process or of the assisted living process? Your process. So people know how, okay. what they're going to get when they deal with you. So my process is actually pretty simple and straightforward. It's broken into three distinct pieces. The first one is the discovery phase where I'll sit down with the family and I will discuss with them what it is their needs and desires are. And this goes back to things like location, financial reality, uh, the amenities people are seeking, what are the medical needs of somebody that they, uh, that somebody may have, what are their long-term goals. And uh, from there, I create a curated list, excuse me, of assisted living, call it assisted living communities, um, if that's what we're looking at, that would be a really good fit for this family and for this potential resident based on the discovery. So if somebody's looking for a pool or if somebody wants to be out, um, uh, you know, in the south, southern part of the state or if somebody wants to be right on the Massachusetts border or they need specific sort of care services, whatever it may be. I'll offer families typically two to three choices to start talking about. I do this because I don't want to overwhelm families with too many choices. I want to make sure right. that the options I'm presenting to families are really thoughtfully chosen so that they don't have to sit there feeling like they're back at square one. Like, well, I could have just Googled all these and had the same thing, you know, right. instead I do a deep dive into these community options for families and talk about why they'd be a good fit and what some of the challenges may be, you know, because very seldom do I find a, a, a perfect community option, but almost always I find an option that's going to be a 
really good fit, not just for today right. or tomorrow, but for the rest of that resonance life. Right. Pre COVID, able to tour these buildings with the families to be their in the moment advocate and guide. So I worked in assisted living for 10 years. So I know what to look for in terms of, you know, what's a really good quality community versus a community that may look great, but isn't actually delivering on the promises that it should be. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously it's been tough to do that. There's a couple of things I can do now. I can, you know, join families on a virtual tour or I can go to a building and uh, bring my tablet and do the virtual tour with the sales director and, and, you know, point things out to the families. There's ways around it. I've had to adapt to right. COVID. Uh, and then from there, once the family makes their decision, they put a deposit down where they want their loved ones to go. And at that point, they can either say, Paul, thanks a bunch. Uh, we're going to take it from here. Or uh, typically what my families do is they want me to stick around through the date of move-in and beyond. I can read the residency agreement. Uh, I negotiate prices for my clients. Uh, I can help choose apartments. And also I can help create those relationships after a person moves in for families who are looking for people like, again, financial planners, elder law attorneys, professional organizers, real estate agents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a straightforward process. And I like to, I like to keep the families as, as insulated as possible from getting bombarded with calls and information. Because typically, like I said, by the time family calls me, they are in crisis mode. So the last thing a family in crisis mode needs is to be getting 15 calls a day from a very well-meaning, um, right. but sometimes overzealous member of, of an assisted living community team, typically their sales director. And so right. when, some, when a family works with me, unless they explicitly tell me it's okay, I will hang on to their phone number and email address, and I'll be the point of contact for the communities I recommend up until the time they're ready or until the, well, really the time they tour. So that helps insulate the family, give them a little breathing room as they're considering their options. What do you so think is the most, yeah, what do you think the most important thing that a family can start doing now before they even start the process to make that process easier down the road? Like, should they be taking their loved one's names off of things or should they, you know what I mean, be doing certain things or looking for certain side effects or something? What is the most important thing that a family can do to start the process without actually starting the process? It actually has a lot to do with paperwork. Um, because especially if, if somebody starts developing symptoms of any type of memory impairment, then that's automatically going to raise concerns um, uh, amongst families about, well, if mom or dad can't make these types of decisions for themselves, who's going to make the decision about them going to an assisted living? Who's going to sign that residency agreement? You know, so if I had to say for anybody watching this today, if you take nothing else from what I said, go and have a conversation with your loved ones now, uh, this week about power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, which in Massachusetts is called a healthcare proxy in case this goes out to Massachusetts. Um, it's never too early to talk about a living will or wishes in general for what you'd want for the rest of your life, you know, be it a medical order for life sustaining treatment or a physician's order for life sustaining treatment, otherwise known as a most or a post. Um, and a discussion with your family about not just what are your wishes, but what are their wishes, you know? And, right. and look, I'm, I'm the plumber with the leaky uh, sink. Cause I'll bring this up to my parents and they'll, they'll all of a sudden like, they will completely ignore me and change the subject because they don't want to hear it. And I get it. It's not a comfortable conversation, but right. again, you can't circle that day on the calendar where you're going to know, that you're going to look back and say, I really wish I had just had this conversation and figured it out. You know, so right. power of attorney, that's the biggest thing. Power of attorney. 
Yeah. I mean, the thing is, too, is if it's not the families watching this, if it's the person themselves and they know that they're getting up in age, I've had this conversation with my 20 year old kids. My kids are in their 20s. And I've had this conversation because, God forbid, a car accident or a, a medical emergency or something happened for me or for them, that you kind of have this and open the door to starting this conversation every now and then to update it, to see if their wishes have changed, to see if their ideas have changed as they have gotten older. So it's never too early to start this conversation um, because, look, I walked into a 10-minute surgery and ended up a wheelchair user in the end of that surgery. My life changed in 10 minutes. That could happen to anybody at any age. So you should always be prepared and you should always. So if you're the elder and you know this is going to be dropped on your kids at some point, open the door to that conversation. Stop telling them your wishes. They may not want to hear it because they think mom and dad are infallible and, you know, superheroes and well, nothing will ever happen, but things happen and the conversation needs to be had. How can people get in contact with you? What are the ways that people can contact you to get these services? The easiest way is to go on my website, which is www.careconciergene.com. So that's www.careconciergene.com. And then ne for New England.com. And on my website, families will be able to schedule a free consultation with me. Um, they will be able to look up a little bit more about the different services that I offer. Uh, there's an FAQ there about the different types of senior care. My phone number is on there as well. So if folks would rather call me, they can, or they can call me um, whenever they want, 401-488-4935. I'm generally accessible. I'm a small business owner. I'm the owner of the company and uh, I work in Massachusetts, Connecticut and Rhode Island. So for any families who are thinking about uh, senior care in the tri-state area, you know, and you think that it might be even a year down the line, give me a call, schedule a consultation. You know, the consultation is free and it's also free for my assisted living or memory care placement services. So most of my clients, uh, you know, they, they don't pay me a dime for the services that I, I provide. So there's no harm in calling and just getting the information now. Do you work alone or do you have a staff working with you or they will always get you at this point? Well, pre-COVID, <laughs> I was trying to uh, hire on some folks, looking at office space, things like that, and then uh, COVID. So it's currently me. Uh, I am partnering right now with a licensed social worker who is helping me with skilled nursing placements. So for, for families who are looking at, well, really Medicaid placements, uh, yes, I can do that. That is a direct cost for the client, and it's called the Nursing Home Navigator Program. But uh, that is an option, and uh, my partner's name is Karen Egan. Oh, that's awesome. And now RAMP is going to be referring you. So you will be a partner of RAMP. You will be one of our resources. So you'll be getting a lot more calls. So you might want to think about hiring other people because we might make you very, very busy, <laughs> which is a good Hope thing so. because that just means that, I mean, RAMP is a national organization. So we are across the country. So, um, you know, people might reach out to you saying, how can I do this? And where I live in my state, or how can I get services like this where I live? So it opens the doors to a lot of other people because things like what you do and what I do are very unique in the world. And I think we need more services like this and we need to spearhead and help our brothers and sisters all across the country make sure that they are taking care of their loved ones. Cause you know, when it comes to be our time, you know, we don't want to think about it, but when it comes our time, I want to make sure my kids make the best decision for me. Um, that I'm happy with, that they're comfortable with, and it makes the process easier. Can elder adults contact you so they can have an idea 
so they can help the families out. Do you have a lot of people like that calling or is it mostly families in crisis? Actually, over the last six weeks, I have had a lot of folks who are over the age of 65 give me a call, which is great because uh, these are typically folks who are not in crisis mode, but they've said, you know what, I just spent a year, um, you know, living, living through Zoom and, right. you know, I know that I want to be if something like this were to happen again, I don't want to be feeling like I'm trapped in my house. I don't want to, I don't want to put uh, my kids in a position where they feel like they have to figure something out for me. I want to be able to have my plan in place and make it easy on them, but also make it easy on, you know, me, me, the senior. And that's turning right. into a big thing. I'm finding with with people, you know, the so-called younger seniors, you know, as as the baby boomers are now entering into that 65 uh, plus. Um, right. Brat, the baby boomers have a really uh, that I'm talking with have a really good perspective on it. They go, you know, I have uh, lived my life on my terms and I, I like setting the, the the terms for for how I live. So why would I want to leave it up to somebody else for what I would want for right. my poster to life? I want to start vetting these options now so that if I need something in the future, uh, my kids know, hey, that's the one I want. That's the apartment I want. That's the type of view I want. Let's figure right. it out. And it's so smart. It's, it's so, so yeah. smart. I think COVID opened a lot of people's eyes because, like I said, there's many in my community, the disability community, with mobility devices that are either paraplegic or quadriplegics or have some other kind of disability who live by ourselves out and about in the community. And COVID was really tough. I mean, we're limited because of, you know, the access to a lot of places. But with COVID, we were really limited. And I think a lot of seniors, even though that they want to age in place and they want to have their independence, I think COVID opened their eyes to, if this happens again, I am really by myself. You know, I can't have people coming in here. I can't take that risk. I can't get out where I want to get out. That I think it's a great idea that seniors are starting to be forthcoming and, you know, thinking of their next step. You know, mm -hmm. nobody wants to live in congregate settings or apartment buildings or stuff like that. You love your homes. You want to live in them. But sometimes it gets to the point where you just can't do that anymore. Right. Well, and you know what else is a big um, uh, kind of a turning point that I'm seeing is <laughs> it's kind of funny. But so for folks who have spent that last year, right, um, kind of isolated in their homes, as they've been focusing on things like, you know, two straight summers of, you know, trying to make their lawn perfect and then shoveling and, and doing handiwork around the house. I'm getting a lot of calls from people who are like, you know what? I am so done with raking leaves. I am done with shoveling. I am done with all this stuff. You know, just get me get me someplace where they'll bring me a margarita at lunch and no one's going to look at me sideways. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. You know? Yeah. So many of these people now are, again, they're social model communities. You know, a, a yeah. assisted living is not a nursing home. And right. that's a big distinction I make for families. And yeah. uh, the secret's out on that. Well, it's so true because, you know, I busted my butt in my wheelchair, making my house all pretty, pretty, put all my flowers up. For what? No one came by to see it. I was the only one that got to enjoy it, which, I mean, it was great that, I, you know, I had my little serenity place to enjoy. But on the other right. hand is you bust your butt to get all this done for nobody to see it but you. Um, so, yeah, I'd rather have some guy come and cut my lawn and do my flowers for me and just enjoy <laughs> the rest of my life, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, that, now that we're nearing the end of the hour, um, give everybody your contact information again and give us your yeah. best thoughts, like the best takeaway from this and what the most important information that people should know from this past hour yeah so, um 
so if if people take away the fact that senior care and aging in general is is something to be approached without fear i think that most people would make better decisions about how their aging journey goes because we're all getting older it's nothing we're going to be able to escape and so i would say take the advice of the folks who i've been talking with lately who are saying i want to dictate the terms of what my post-retirement life is like i want to take that control and and really make sure that I have a say in my quality of life and my ability to age in place where I want to age in place and how I want to age in place. And I think that nobody should be afraid of information. People can call me today and say, Paul, I just want information. I'm not going to make a move this month or year. It might be two years. Great. Get the information. Let's talk. Let's figure out what you want. Let's talk about maybe some misconceptions you might have about senior care. You know, I would say a good 40 to 50% of my calls are people who say, start off by saying, my loved one needs a nursing home. Why do they need a nursing home? Well, they, they, they use a walker. No, that's not a person that needs a nursing home, typically. I mean, you're talking about a nursing home is a medical model facility setting. So I dive into it and, and families have this sense of relief because they go, oh, I thought they would have to be in this nursing home environment. And no, typically families uh, have so much misinformation around what senior care is all about. So get the information. Let's start making a plan. It's never too early to start making that plan because you can't circle that day on the calendar and figure out when it is you're going to need these options. And, you know, I, I encourage people to touch whenever they want. Again, my name is Paul Jones. I own the Care Concierge in New England. 401-488-4935. And that's Paul, P-A-U-L, at careconciergene.com. Or visit the website, www.careconciergene.com. That's C-A-R-E, C-O-N-C. I E R G N E dot com. And if anybody forgets any of that information, you can just go to Ramp's website um, from Facebook. You can go to Ramp's website. This episode will be posted on the website with Paul's website on there. So you'll be able to just click right through to Paul's website and you will be able to get in touch with Paul. If you can't get in touch with Paul or those links don't work, send me a message and I will get you in touch with Paul because we're going to be working together and we're going to be, you know, making sure that we make the right referrals because just I want everybody to know that just because your senior has to use a mobility device does not mean their life is over. My wheelchair gives me wings. My wheelchair gives me freedom and mobility. My legs don't work. My mouth sure does is what I like to tell everybody. And I bet you any money there'll be any senior out there that will tell you the same thing. I may not be able to walk to smack you, but don't tell me that <laughs> I can't make my own decisions. So make sure that you're listening. Just because they are physically immobile does not mean they're mentally immobile. So make sure you're listening to your seniors um, and your parents as always. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so like I said, if you can't get Paul and you don't click through through the website, make sure you reach out to me and I will get you in touch with Paul and all of the information. And just a reminder to everybody that all seniors need their red bag that carries all of their medical information on them at all times with no um, UPC cords, no tech issues, no nothing. Go to Ramp's website and grab your red bag today. I'm going to be donating some to Paul to give out to some of his clients um, to make sure that they're covered. And we're just going to keep spreading the word. We have over 50,000 of these bags out across the country. Um, first responders are looking for them. So it doesn't have to be a ramp red bag. It just has to be a red bag with your medical information in it to make sure that you're covered. Um, but Paul, thank you so much for taking the time 
to join us tonight. Give us your website, email, and phone number one more time. Um, and like I said, they can always click through on our website to go right to your website. You bet. And, and thank you very much. This was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed talking with you tonight. So my name is Paul Jones. I own the Care Concierge New England. My number is 401-488-4935. You can email me at paul at careconciergene.com or visit my website, www.careconciergene.com. And like I said, you can always reach out to us and we will make sure because me and Paul are going to be having many conversations in the future. We will be partnering with many more events going forward in the future. So reach out to me and I will make sure that you get in contact with Paul um, to make sure. Look him up, call him up and get the information. Information is power. Things that you may be thinking may not be the truth. Things that you may be afraid of that you're, you're failing mom or dad because, you know, you need to make a move. You're probably doing the best thing for them going forward. So get rid of the, um, you know, the poor me. Get rid of the I'm doing something wrong. Get the information. Empower yourself to make a great choice and give your family members the best end of life that you could possibly give them. It could be for 10 years. It could be for 30 years, but give them the best end of life is possible with the safest environment that's beautiful, that's helpful, and will give them a sense of purpose because there are many places that give them a sense of purpose and that's what you're doing for them. So thank you again, Paul. Like I said, you can, you can access and send everybody to our website to get your contact information as well. And I can't thank you enough and I look forward to working with you down the road. Likewise. Thank you. And I want everybody to join us back here next Wednesday night because we will be talking to the SILK, the um, Statewide Independent Living Council, um, next week so you can learn all about what they do and how they help um, you navigate the world of Rhode Island and elder care and disability care and everything that they need to know about independent living. So we'll see you all back here next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Have a great week, everybody. And don't just sit there. Make a difference. Have a great one, Paul. Thank you again. You too, Tina.